Sexist, a killer, a loner, these are three main attributes of James Bond, and they also define him in the novels of his creator, Ian Fleming, whose books form the basis for the films. In writing the stories, uh, we always go back to the novels because uh, that's where you that find the touchstone for the character. You find elements and situations where the character is uh, as being put uh, into interesting situations, and you can see how he reacted. It's sort of the uh, archive for uh, the Bond character. Ian Fleming even expressed opinions as to some of the casting of the main roles. When Sean was hired, uh, I believe Fleming called him that great snorting lorry driver, was not happy, and then grew to love him as the pictures took off and Sean was so wonderful. It's a Dom Perignon 55. It'd be a pity to break it. I prefer the 53 myself. And who was first choice to play the original villain? Clumsy effort, Mr. Bond. You disappoint me. None other than Noel Coward. Noel was uh, asked to play um, Dr. No, and uh, <laughs> he was quite funny about it because I became very friendly with Noel, too. Coward was also an acquaintance of the Flemings in Jamaica. He'd built his house on a hilltop. Fleming built his by the sea. I visited his house. He, he had died in Goldeneye uh, in Jamaica. Uh, which Noel Coward, who was his neighbor, used to call golden eye, ears, nose, and throat. Uh, he had sort of contempt for, for Fleming as a kind of poseur, whereas uh, he, Noel Coward, was, was the genuine article, the genuinely sophisticated fellow. Coward even thought that he knew who Fleming had based James Bond upon. No, I think that James Bond was Ian's dream fantasy of what he would like to be, you know ruthless and dashing and it's got as Ian had a schoolboy quality I think no question Fleming wanted to be Bond people do connect me with James Bond simply because I happen to like scrambled eggs and short sleeved shirts and some of the things that James Bond does but uh, I certainly haven't got his guts nor his uh, very lively appetite so Fleming wasn't Bond nor was he a spy in real life but he was at the Admiralty during the war, working in naval intelligence. His position, really, uh, to put it in modern parlance, he was the combination of an ideas man and a fixer. He seemed to live two lives, one during the daytime when he was working here, and the other at nighttime when he went out into the social world to his bridge parties and other things. He was in contact with real spies, could one of them have been a model for Bond? The most obvious one was the, the chief, um, the MI6 station chief in Paris, um, who was uh, a rather flamboyant character called uh, Biffy Dunderdale. And uh, he used to travel around Paris in a Rolls Royce, which seems to be kind of almost the, the wrong thing to do if you're a, a spy, sort of bringing attention to yourself. But apparently he used to do this. Uh, and he was very effective, um, in fact, in his job. If Fleming borrowed a flamboyant character for his hero, the name he gave him was more mundane. I wanted to find a really flat, quiet name. And one of my Bibles out here is James Bond's Birds of the West Indies. And I thought, well, now, James Bond, now, that's a pretty quiet name. And so I simply stole it and used it. Inspiration for his romantic vacations proved very easy. After all, he bought his house in Jamaica after the war, and he came there to write every year. He had this three months uh, holiday that he'd um, earmarked for himself in Jamaica. He would go out there, he wouldn't hang around, um, he didn't socialize very much, or at least he had just one or two friends that he would see. And he would sit down and uh, tap away at his typewriter, and uh, by the time he came to go back to England, usually sort of end of March, perhaps early April, um, he had a, a novel um, in his bag. His books were distinguishable from the American spy genre by one obvious factor, the nationality of Bond. His books are 
very British Raj. I mean, he is very full of the Englishness more than just the Britishness uh, of that character. It not only uh, distinguishes him from a lot of other action adventure films, but I think it accounts for a lot of his um, personality and a lot of the traits that the Bond character has, his sophistication, his sense of dress, uh, sense of decorum, his manners, his um, knowledge of fine wines and cigars and brandies and all kinds of things. No, just but yet. Pity about your liver, sir. It's an unusually fine Solera. 51, I believe. There is no year for sherry, 007. I was referring to the original vintage on which the sherry is based, sir. 1851. Don't mistake it all. Precisely. I think that with the character of Bond, it may be the only time in modern, in modern era where the, the two words British and panache actually work together. I think right now being English is a very popular thing to be. I mean, look at Austin Powers. I mean, it seems that everything English is very cool. And uh, Bond has always epitomized not only the elegant Englishman, but the Englishman of all countries, you know, the, um, the man who fits in anywhere, the man who's got a certain air and a certain class and who can really sweet talk his way into any situation and out of any situation, and I think that's what people identify with. Over there. You missed Mr. Bond. Did I? As you said, such good sport. The way he behaves, the, the stiff upper lip, the sardonic smile, all the things that made Bond you, just as not American. The ironic character, Americans don't really understand irony, do they? I mean, that's very much an English sense of humour, which they love when they see it, but they're not able to reproduce it themselves. One other thing that Bond has, which most of these kind of films don't have, he has a certain amount of charm, and the film has charm. But charm alone won't rescue Bond when he's skied off a cliff. What about heroism and a few special gadgets and pieces of kit? Or British man, of course. Good evening, Mr. Bond. Good evening, Mr. Bond. Bonjour, Monsieur Bond. Goodbye, Mr. Bond. This is the part I really like. When push comes to shove, What's kept Bond going, anyway? Backseat driver. I think the reason that James Bond is surviving is because it sort of buys into that myth that we all have. It's, it's the great myth about the heroes. And uh, James Bond certainly is a very uh, current hero. He comes in, and he's a strong, silent type, does the job, and moves on. And I think that's very much about Bond. He's not someone who kind of regurgitates his his drama or his past, all that, over everything. So I think that's a kind of a strong element in, in a heroic character. All Bond's other attributes would be pointless if he weren't a hero who could perform remarkable feats. Does anything underpin this? There's the psychological theory of archetypes, powerful, symbolic figures that resonate for us all. Figures like the stranger, an unknown, maybe threatening outsider, who arrives, sorts out problems, and leaves. <laughs> 